Right, hiya folks who are joining us tonight. Uh, we are with a mystery guest, um, but maybe you know by the name of the title, with their former F-111 pilot, Jeff Gwynn. So what's happening on your end, Jeff? Looks like you're about to go flying. About 15 minutes ago, I, uh, I decided to take some yeah, acting classes. I know, with that <laughs> pilot Jack Gwynn. So what's happening in your... I um, decided to take an acting class starting about 15 minutes ago, and, and it's method acting. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to get into the role. And um, <laughs> so I hope I haven't overdone it too much. Love it. Uh, you know, it's never, never too dark to be cool. <laughs> and uh, so now that I've gotten into the role, um, I'm going to reach my real life here. I mean, that was awesome. Yes. That was, <laughs> what an intro that was. Uh, so cheers for that, Jeff. But uh, yeah, it's, it's great to have you back. It's been a while since we've talked last. Uh, but yeah, what's been happening? Because I think it's probably two, two and a half years the last time you spoke. What's been going on your end before the guys get the questions coming in? Uh, let me see. Um, since I'm an elderly, uh, rather a chronologically gifted gentleman, um, and I'm retired every day is Saturday. So I've been able to do a lot of things that uh, wouldn't be able to do otherwise. A lot of traveling. Uh, I spent a month in Southeast Asia uh, just a little over a year ago. And uh, this summer, um, last summer, spent six weeks in Europe. Um, river cruise down the Rhine and then uh, time in Switzerland and France and Italy. Um, just got back from Yellowstone National Park a couple days ago, did a uh, day-long snow machine tour through there, which is it's really different in the winter. It's like nobody, but nobody's really seen in the winter because the whole park's closed. Anyway, that was pretty neat. So a lot of traveling, household project. Uh, my son bought a house, uh, got married about a year and a half ago, so I've been helping him with some house projects. And then... Uh, uh, just doing a whole lot of wasting the Earth's precious and limited uh, gravity resources. <laughs> well, Jeff, it sounds like you've, uh, yeah, you, you, it's, it sounds like a tough life at the moment, but uh, not jealous at all. But uh, yeah, we're going to get stuck into this uh, Q&A, which is going to be a great one, as Jeff's always a great guest. So guys, get your questions coming in the comments, and I'm sure Jeff will get them. But uh, yeah, scroll to the top, Jeff, and I'm going to let you loose and enjoy. Okay, well, Ian... Uh, Ian asked, what was my favorite Scottish low-flying location? And his, this is Glencoe, he, uh, heading westbound from uh, Rannoch Moor. And I, um, I'd have to say my favorite low-fly area in all of the UK, in fact, of all of Europe, was what we called LFA 14, which was pretty much uh, Scotland from... Yeah, north of Edinburgh, all the way up to Wick. And um, we liked that the best because the rules were uh, most lenient due to the fact that very few people, a lot of, there's a lot of wide open space up there, not a lot of uh, uh, avoidance areas, and we could go down to 250 feet um, legally. Uh, sometimes feet uh, aren't always the same length. Sometimes they get shorter than others. Uh, the problem with LFA 14 was about, it was about a 45 minute drag from upper Hayford up to uh, favorite range up there with, I think Tane range is my favorite range in the UK. Um, Rose Hardy was, that's over, uh, near, I want to say Banff up there in Scotland. Um, so LFA 14 was the best by far, but the, um, it was just a long haul getting there and back. So if you had a two and a, <clears throat> excuse me, I need a I need a cough button on the mic here. Um, the in a two and a half hour, normally two and a half hour mission, you'd spend an hour and getting there and back. Um, the other low fly area, since we're on the subject that I liked, was LFA. If I remember correctly, LFA seven, which uh, was where the, that's where the mock loop is. If I'm got my geography sorted, that's uh, Wales. And that was pretty close. Um, and we kind of beat the heck out of that because of its closeness. Anyway, those were my two favorite flow fly areas. 
uh, far rather uh, go there than um, we used to go to Europe sometimes, uh, go to Germany, France occasionally. It was such a pain in the neck with the French. And, uh, you know, so that part was okay. But again, it was a bit of a drag and the, um, the uh, constraints were just a lot greater. Um, okay, I, this sounds like uh, what I would use as a very strong password user dash and then many characters that don't relate to each other. The, did the US 111s do a dump and burn? Not officially. Um, I don't, I can't remember. I don't think there was any rule prohibiting it. Uh, but the only, um, but on the other hand, it was not encouraged. It was never supposed to be part of any aerial demonstrations we did. And um, despite the lack of encouragement, I don't think I know of a single guy who didn't do it at one time or another. Um, and I think the statute of limitations allows me to say that I am one of those guys. The Aussies did it like all the time. And it was it, <clears throat> watching the um, Aussie videos and they, they still flew the, the uh, gosh, I wish I didn't have something in my throat. Sorry about that. The, um, <clears throat> The uh, Aussies flew after the widespread adoption of digital cameras. And so there was just a lot more photos and videos of Aussie 111s than, than the Air Force, than the US 111s, which were all gone by 97. But I swear, I can't, you can't watch an Aussie video or see a picture of an Aussie F-111 without flames coming out the back of it. It was almost like that was the official mission of the F-111 was to dump and burn. Um, on to Fieldy33, who asks, did you work with European nations on a regular basis? Yes, um, the, I think the, um, most, the most intense uh, involved uh, working with European nations was the tactical leadership program which was, I think it was three weeks at Norvenik, Germany, uh, air, airfield on the north coast of Germany, um, kind of west of uh, Helgoland. No, that's no, not the, uh, I can't remember the region of Germany. It's kind of the uh, Schleswig-Holstein, that's it. Uh, just a little bit west of there. And it was a three week course for guys who'd been picked um, it was like almost like a mini red flag in a way. And we had participants from all the NATO air forces there and we'd operate out of, um, out of uh, Norvenik for the entire three weeks. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. And it was different. It was really interesting to see how like the German air force was really different. They had dining halls for the pilots and uh, um, I can't promise that the French drank wine during lunch. They might have. It would be like them. Actually, they weren't there. They didn't participate, but everyone else did. Uh, so that I did that on my first tour there. And TLP was still ongoing, but I think pretty certain by the time I left after my second tour. And then we had uh, Tiger meets. And that was each, each of the NATO Air Forces had a Tiger squadron. And there'd be a Tiger meet once a year where all the squadrons would get together and and talk tactics and weapons, uh, but mostly drink beer and get into shenanigans. So yeah, we did work with a pretty regular basis, and I um, and I'm sure there there were other exercises that we did. Did planning, uh, uh, did plan joint planning and stuff like that. So yeah, pretty regular, at least while I was there, and I left in 1992. Steel Beast Cavalry asks, how complicated were the procedures to carry nuclear weapons? Um, like one word answer would be fiendishly, fiendishly complicated. The, and I could probably, even with my rusty memory, I could probably chew up the entire hour kind of describing it, but it was complex at every level. The munitions folks who had charge of the weapons and storage 
and loading and unloading and transporting, everything had to be meticulously uh, tracked and inspected. You could bust a, uh, a weapons inspection if they had a tie down strap that hadn't, hadn't been tracked for maintenance and inspection. Just a tie down strap could, could bust the whole thing. Uh, we had a nuclear alert commitment. Uh, my first two were there, which was really, uh, they got rid of it by, by my second time around. Uh, I was there first time, 81 to 84, and the second time from uh, middle of 88 to the middle of 92. Uh, but during the, um, uh, when we had the commitment, we'd have eight airplanes on alert. They had to be maintained. We had to go out and run the engines. We had to inspect the weapons. Uh, we had to certify that we knew the stuff, that we knew the procedures. Um, and then we would live in the alert facility uh, either four, four days or three days, depending whether during the week or the weekend. Um, then there were authentication procedures. So there were codes that we had to, they would like uh, messages that would be encoded. And we had coding materials with us in the airplane. And um, anyway, I, I, it was just extremely complicated. And it, it, it was, I'm just glad we'd stopped doing the alert thing. It was it, it, very intensive. We even had, uh, we'd have exercises where they'd load out airplanes. And so the whole wing, uh, the exercise we had, they were called Salty Nations and they invariably always had the same scenario. We'd hold out against the uh, ugly, unshaven head of hegemonic, uh, monolithic communism for about a week, and they'd start overrunning us. And then the only game left in town was was the silver bullets. And then we'd do a loadout, and uh, and don't oh, can't remember if we taxied with them, but there was always somebody in the in each hardened air, air uh, aircraft shelter area who had who owned the weapons. And so that could be, depending on where, which part it was in the exercise, that could be like one pilot was like, you are, you are designated the owner of all these weapons until they get turned back to the weapons people. Um, not a lot of fun, super complex, and a lot of liability on everything. Um, then ha uh, Haken Engman asks, and this is a question I often get, and it, it is a really understandable question, actually. Uh, why is the F-111 called a fighter when it is clearly an attack aircraft or possibly a bomber? And it, it seems natural, it might seem natural that the, you might say B-111 or A-111, certainly we have the A-10 and the A-7, the A-6, uh, the last one being a Navy airplane. So why not the A-111? Well, there's a, a kind of a classification scheme that makes sense that is more involved with the aircraft design than the role it's in. And so essentially every airplane in the inventory that has one or two crew, one or two seats, one or two engines that are afterburning is a fighter. That rule is, well, there's only one exception I can think of. So an A-10 has one seat done in afterburners. Uh, A-7, same thing. A-6, no afterburners. Um, the only exception to that rule is the F-117, which by classification should have been the A-117. No idea why it wasn't. Um, so it's really more about the design type than the uh, than the role it fulfills. Otherwise, we'd be calling the, the B-15E. Uh, most F-16s do ground attack. Um, so if you, if you put it in the sense of a role, then you'd start having to throw things around when actually this type of air, the design characteristics are more descriptive because you could throw air-to-air -air missiles on an F-111 and project uh, 
say, AIM-7s, if you had a little bit slightly different weapon system put on the airplane, you could have put AIM-7s on a F-111 and project those uh, air to air missiles further and faster and stay longer, and it would be acting as a fighter. Um, an A-10 or an A-7 or an A-1, uh, as it should have been, an A-117 could never do that because they just weren't fast enough. And uh, so that's kind of why I think the classification works the way it is. It's not a role thing because the role could change. It's more of a uh, theoretical capabilities. Uh, I hope that makes sense because it, it really, it's an excellent question. It gets asked a lot, um, but it, the answer to it is uh, a little bit uh, non-intuitive. Um, the freckle, freckle puny asks uh, a related question to the difficulty of a complexity of nukes. Did you personally know of any pilots who at any time voiced any qualms about the possibility of using them? No. Um, it's the sort of thing that, uh, and I think, again, I can go with the statute of limitations here. Uh, if we actually launched, <clears throat> Uh, and we had, they had levels of escalation involved here and to demonstrate seriousness uh, at a, uh, how serious the situation was get. And one of them was we take, uh, we, the airplanes would launch and we'd go to, go to holding patterns that could easily be seen from the Soviet Union. And we'd go to holding patterns and then go into holding and we kind of had a limit there where you could hold for a certain amount of time, then eat and go or come because you need enough gas to get to your target. Uh, but if they had if they had launched us, if they had pushed us out of the hold or launched us directly to the target, I uh, I was going to drive that airplane right into the North Sea. There was no way I was going to dro drop a nuke, period. It's not going to do it. Um, and uh, I'd far rather just drive it into the ocean and call it a life than, than ever use one of them, no matter the situation. Um, thankfully, uh, we've le I think we've pretty much left those dark times behind. Um, so let's hope they stay behind. Uh, Neuropilot asks, how did the FB-111 compare to, or F-111 compare to the F-15E? Um, <clears throat> I think the F-111, is a somewhat better performs the uh, night all weather deep interdiction mission somewhat the F one eleven F I'm talking about somewhat better than the F fifteen E it it uh, could go a little faster uh, had better range um, and I think the biggest real difference is that because the paved tack I'm gonna pull up my um, visual aid here. In the F 111F, the paved tack was mounted. That's the IR uh, and laser pod that, that uh, we used at night to hit things. The F 111F did. It mounted right here. And the camera, the IR camera and laser turret was at the back. And so the typical delivery at the F 111F. Uh, would do would be a toss and say uh, Mike's image on my screen is the target. Uh, you'd pull up about six miles out, get up to 45 degrees nose high, and launch. Really, probably only needed one weapon. They may have launched two for uh, redundancy. And that weapon would go in a parabolic arc, about six miles range, <clears throat> if the thing was launched at about 600 knots. And as a as the weapons come off, then the airplane rolls to about 120 degrees, and now the, the, the targeting pod is still looking at the target. And as the plane sweeps around, the targeting pod swivels and can still lays the target. And then by the time the airplane gets turned through to about here, the, uh, the weapon has hit the target. So the reason the 111F is better is because it's directly underneath the center line. You could, based on terrain, tactics, threats, or anything, you could go left, you could go right. The F-15E 
it has a paved tack pod. I think it's mounted on the left, and I don't think they can switch it based on mission requirements. So if you're going to the left, that's fine. But if you're going the other way, then it's trying to, the, then the fuselage blanks the laser beam. And the, the, I think they call it the podium effect. And so the, the one advantage, significant advantage the uh, F-11F had over the F-15E was tactical flexibility. The other elements were kind of marginal. And I think the uh, F-15E uh, certainly would, uh, maintenance cost, maintenance man hour per flight hour equation would come way ahead of the uh, F-111, just difference in technology. Some of that might have been fixed with, uh, if we got in Jeep, we, our later, air, we had airplanes that get modified with, uh, what the, um, oh geez, I can't. Can't think quite think of the acronym a AMP Aviation Avionics Modernization Program. Added ring laser gyros, GPS, and digital flight controls. And the um, improvements in reliability were so significant that some of the that the parts they put on the airplane by the time they retired the airplane, they had no mean time between failure numbers. The meantime between failure was was how long you could go, how long a system could go, um, say flight control, the, the flight control computers, how long a flight control computer would operate uh, the mean flight control computer out of a big number of them could operate before failure. And that was measured in tens of hours for a lot of the systems on the uh, F-111. The Avionics Modernization Program, they didn't have any MTBF failures like on the, uh, the ring laser gyro INS. Never had one fail. We had, like, you wouldn't go two weeks without having an INS, an uh, analog INS fail on the F-111E. So tactically a little bit more flexible for the F-111, uh, but uh, otherwise the F-15E is superior. And I know they practice the F-15 by F-15E flexing to an air-to-air -air roll, but they're never going to use it that way. They're always going to use it in the same way the F-111 is because was because the asset's too valuable to go out and be planking the enemy one at a time. <clears throat> now let's see, where am I going here? Um, uh, uh, Aside from the wing, this is Steel Beast Cavalry. Aside from the wing, what was the most complicated system on the VARC? Well, the wing really wasn't complicated. Um, it was, it really, it really consisted of nothing more than a, than a trombone handle attached to a hydraulic valve that drove a jack screw that moved the wings via bell cranks uh, to varying degrees. That's, uh, technically, that system was extremely simple. Um, it had some things going along with it that made it difficult. The uh, aircraft's handling characteristics were very different, uh, depending on the wing sweep. They could, uh, you could get in conditions where the airplane, if it was upside down, wouldn't roll properly. And if you didn't have enough altitude, then that was all the worse for you. Uh, but complexity-wise, it really wasn't that difficult. What was really complex was the terrain-following radar and its integration with the flight control system. And uh, you know, the, I think the, we had one checklist step in the entire checklist, getting off. You know. Before, uh, before start checklist involving the wings, and that was check to make sure the the uh, wings the wing sweep matched the handle where the handle position was because the handle might have been moved after it was shut down, and if the wings let's say the wings were at 16 and and some some maintenance involved moving the wing sweep handle back to 26, but the wings were still at 16, you, you could get a hot start in the engine because the um, the starter the uh, pneumatic starter was trying to drive not just the engine, but also the hydraulic pumps as well to push all that volume through to move the 
wings to the position that the handle was at. Um, and that was it. That was one. That was the only step. And then, uh, but for it was like four pages of very complex, order dependent, uh, contortionist uh, checklist steps to to get the uh, TFR ready to go. You had to had to check for low altitude radar altimeter override operation. You had to check for fly up. You had to confirm the aux flight reference attitude uh, was consistent to the inertial attitude. Um, you know, I, I, if I were to just read that checklist, it would take, it, it was about, I'd say a better part of five minutes if everything went well. And it involved, you'd have to be pushing down something here and reaching back to the, to the flight control uh, switch panel in the back and flipping switches and doing this. And if you got it wrong, you have to redo it from the start. It was really, that was super complex. And um, the complexity went into the uh, flight control system because the TFR would send commands to the flight control computers, which would then position um, the dampers, the flight control dampers. I think I'm getting these words right. I should have grabbed my flight manual and done some studying before this. And so it was actually a bit of a fly-by-wire airplane, the very first one, because the it wasn't like the stick move. When the airplane was rolling, well, that was the roll was not controlled by the TFR, but when the aircraft was moving, the stick didn't move because the TFR was sending uh, commands directly to the flight control system, which was positioning the flight controls to null what the TFR command uh, it was getting. Um, uh, Mike L asks, uh, were pilots for the EF-111 taken from other 111 platforms? Uh, pretty much, I don't know of anybody who went, and this probably changes the F-111 retired in 97, but the EF-111 remained in the inventory. But I think almost all the guys I knew in the EF came from somewhere else. A lot of them were first, <clears throat> had been first assignment IPs in pilot training, typically T-38 guys, and then they go from T-38s to EF-111s. Uh, I don't, other than when the airplane first went in the inventory, I, I know there were some guys who went from the F-111 to the EF at that point, but the mission was just so different. The airplane itself, you could have, you could have chucked me in the left seat of an EF and um, I would, okay, like, fine, we're going out here and we're, you know, tell me what, what the plan is for the airplane. Uh, so the uh, left seat, the, the pilot's mission, the pilot's skills were not specialized to the EF-111. Um, but because the, the F-111 was more, far more specialized. There are all kinds of things you have to do in the F-111 you wouldn't have to do in an EF, but the training was just entirely different. So it literally wouldn't make any sense to, to have a common training pipeline uh, pass the initial qualification because it was just so much different. Uh, as far as the right seat goes, the EWO, completely, totally uh, specialized and complex, lots of extra training. Um, are, are substantially different training uh, from the F-111. So I, I think the, the crew forces for the two platforms were uh, completely different. Excuse me, I need to get just a sip here. Apologies. Um, let's see. Uh, Dave Smith asked, how did the reliability of the VARC evolve over your time with it? It, it got better. I started the F with the F-111D in 1970, uh, middle of 1979. And at that point, the uh, engines had lots of so many problems that in the F-111D that half the airplanes on the ramp didn't have engines in them. 
the F-11D was a bit of a special case because it was really the first attempt at a digital airplane, but the technology at the time was small scale integration. So there was big circuit boards with lots of parts on them. And you started accumulating that mean time between failure thing. And it was just, that airplane was always broken. Not enough parts, always broken. You might get scheduled five times to fly a night mission before you actually got one off. Part of that was due to the airplane and part of that was uh, due to the knock-on effects of the Carter administration, which uh, had different priorities for the federal budget than keeping the military uh, fully supplied. Uh, by the time I got flying the airplane, uh, Reagan took over and had become president and I think a much more balanced view towards uh, supporting the forces that we decided we were going to field. Um, and then also at that time, I, w I got to England flying the F-111E, which had reliability issues because analog stuff just breaks. But the engines were pretty, had gotten pretty good. And um, I bet two thirds of the flights that I flew came back code one, that is with no, no maintenance required. And uh, mostly didn't have uh, failures that would, would knock you off, that would, would abort the mission. So uh, I think the big issue with the F-111 was the just, it was like 35, I want to say 35 maintenance man hours per flight hour. And a lot of that happened at depot level maintenance. So about every, I want to say 1,000 hours or so, they'd go back to the depot at McClelland up near Sacramento. And the airplanes would basically get disassembled around like the left generator and then put all back together again. And one of the things they had to do with the airplane was they had a big hanger for it. They'd chill it to minus 40, strap it to the ground and put jacks on the wings that would flex the wings to uh, plus seven, the, the flex that have it, seven point, plus 7.3 Gs and minus three. Um, and that's just expensive. It takes a lot of time and it's super expensive. And, and that whole depot level maintenance thing is just a different beast anymore. So that was, it was reliability got a lot better. And like I mentioned earlier with the amp airplanes, especially with that, but it was still ju just a lot of maintenance going on. Uh, let's see, Sven Hunt, uh, I says, you've said before that, that flying, uh, it's the past and you don't miss it, but do you fly online in DCS or MS 2020? Um, no, I, um, in the, you know, when I said, you know, it's in the past, no, it's like, I don't know how old Sven is, I don't know how old you are Sven, but you get to a point where things end and you just have to, I mean, I think for mental health or uh, you just have to be able to just put it away. Yes, I, I, guys, I have some super intense memories that I will always have, um, but you can't miss it. So that's what I mean. I say I have intense memories that are very that I that I'm very lucky to have, um, but I don't spend a lot of time thinking of it. Don't have any real drive to do it again. Um, although now that you mention it, I, it would be kind of fun to do. I think, I, except I think there's a pretty high investment in uh, doing it. To, you know, like have the controls and the visuals and all that stuff. Just. As a side note, um, when I was in uh, Europe last summer, we went to Italy and we got pretty close to Marinello and I had a, I had a choice. I could go shopping and see cathedrals or I could go to the Ferrari Museum. Well, I did the latter. I hope that's no surprise. And in the museum, they had uh, some F1 simulators that uh, like 30 quid for I don't know, 10 minutes, something like that. So it wasn't cheap, but it was pretty intense. That those simulation and those, you know, just a car, I can imagine, because in some ways an airplane is easier to simulate than a car. 
but that was pretty cool driving the F1 simulator. And I'm sure getting in a F111 E or any other sim with a good set of flight controls and visuals, that'd be pretty intense. Um, let's see, I got to flip a little bit too far here. Um, Okay, Martin Ward asks, did I ever get close to ejecting? Uh, and how did I feel about the escape module? Uh, I, I never got close to pulling the handle. I almost got ejected. And a little bit of backstory on that. Um, see if I can keep it short. Uh, I was with a check doing a night TFR checkout with a second lieutenant Wizzo had just come from mountain home replacement training uh, in the States. And it might've been his first night mission and we were over Germany and descending into a low level in Germany. And as we were going through, through some cloud and if there's static buildup on the airplane, uh, you can often pick that up on a UHF radio because the electromagnetics of static buildup happen to radiate in UHF frequencies. And you hear the screeching on the radio. Mostly, it you hear screeching and it goes away. Sometimes, the screeching is followed by a bang. I've been hit by lightning at least twice. Uh, but this is one of those times we're descending into a low level, about 3,000 feet above the ground, and just this almighty bang, giant flash. Uh, I was flash blinded. I couldn't see a thing. Um, so I paddled off the TFR because on a TFD scent, and I pulled the stick straight, and I leaned forward as far as I could to try and see the ADI and push the throttles up to full power. And as I was doing that, I, I keyed the interphone and said, we're okay. And I have no idea why I said that, uh, but I did. And, and that was basically, it was bang, giant flash. I knew it was lightning. I don't know, I think it was the first time I'd ever been struck, but I knew it was lightning. Uh, kind of instinctively, and so started to pull up, and that was about five or five or so seconds, not very long. I could see the ADI, so I could confirm I, you know, wasn't getting an unusual attitude. Stabilized pitch attitude at 10 degrees, and went to full power, and then gradually my uh, vision expanded enough to see the airspeed indicator was rolling off, and uh, so I went. So I went to afterburner to keep stop that happening, got a little bit more vision, saw that the uh, right engine had, had rolled back to idle because the, uh, the shock wave from the lightning strike had compressor stalled the right engine. Anyway, that's the end of that story. We covered and went home. And uh, I think we went in the debrief, the right seater told me that if the if the like about the first thing that happened was him he hearing me say we're okay he was reaching for the ejection handle because he thought the airplane had exploded so uh and that's what he said i'm not you know I, uh, and i think it's entirely possible because it was really pretty uh it was kind of violent actually not not a lot of fun uh so how do i feel about the escape capsule it was essential given the operational envelope of the airplane and where we spent most of our time and what we were doing when we were there uh, meant that no ejection seat at the time and i'm not uh, i guess i don't know what the f-15e guys do i don't know um the russians had pretty good they had much better ejection seats than we did uh, and protected the pilot better uh, from wind blasts but the ejection seat at the time the f-111 they had just been torn apart would never survive uh, an ejection in most of our operational envelope or where we spent most of our time. Um, so uh, that part was great because I think the uh, F-111 has the, holds the world speed record for a successful ejection. Guys went out at uh, two, Mach 2.3 over New Mexico after uh, 
a flight control hydraulic valve failure, and uh, they walked away from it. Um, the downside was the thing hit the ground, about a 35G impact when it hit the ground. And, and so lots of guys had one or more broken vertebrae. Every one of them ended up about an inch shorter, but I guess that beats the heck out of uh, getting torn apart. Um, Brian Farrow asks, were Sparrows ever fitted to the 11? Yes. For any good reason? No. Um, the, the, there were pylons, I don't, don't have them on this model right now. There are two pivoting pylons on either side. And uh, during Desert Storm, we carried AIM-9 Papas on the outer shoulder station of each pylon. So we carried two, but they are IR missiles. And there's no way you can employ an IR missile at night. So it, it was just, I think it was kind of uh, a sop to our desire to be seen as manly as the air to air guys. It's, there was no other reason for them. Uh, there's just no way you could ever employ it. So, but they didn't have any, they didn't weigh anything and didn't have any drag associated with them. So, so we, uh, you know, airplane looked cooler in pictures, but other than that, there was no point to it. Um, uh, Dave Smith asks, uh, how much did different squadrons specialize in different weapon profiles and missions? It really differed by aircraft type. The uh, F-111A and E were, had basically had to fly over the target to get anything like decent results. And so, and just confining ourselves to the uh, night mission, because that was the only realistic mission for the airplane. Basically, we did what are called laydowns. Uh, flew directly over the target and uh, hoped that getting close enough to our work would produce good results. Uh, the F-111F, because of the paved tack, uh, it could do very accurate uh, not, not only laydowns, but like I mentioned earlier, the low toss uh, tactic could provide them lots of standoff from the target. They were getting like six six miles of standoff, and they were going really fast and flying a very dynamic maneuvering profile. So, uh, and by the time uh, the defense could get a weapon pointed your direction, uh, they'd be you know, they'd be trying to hit a target that's receding at, at 600 knots. And then it, it just, there's almost no missiles out there uh, that could hit, both hit a low altitude target and have enough uh, propellant in the missile to catch a, a target that's leaving the scene at, you know, from six miles away at 600 knots. So that, but that would be F-111F, that it specialized in that because it could do it, but all the squadrons, all the F-111Fs did the same thing, and all the F-111Es did the same thing. Um, let's see. Uh, John Minter asks, with which squadrons I fly the F-111? At Mountain, at, I started Cannon Air Force Base, and I flew, I did my replacement training in the 481st, which was strictly replacement training for Cannon got pilot staying at Cannon, and then I went to the five, uh, let's see, not the five, 524th. It was a 524th. Um, that was a squadron did replacement training for guys going to Lake and Heath. But I was one of the two lieutenants on the whole base who were, at the time, who were in the left seat of the 111. They had no idea what to do with us. So they, they put us uh, in that squadron, and I know the 520, I'm pretty certain 524th is the wrong number for that. It's the other, anyway, the, the uh, Crusaders was the, the mascot for that squadron. So they chucked us into that squadron, and so we were operational guys in an RTU squadron. Don't know why they did that. And then they, I think that's, because they didn't have to worry about whether they're sending us to red flag or not, because that squadron didn't go to red flag. And finally they realized this was just dumb, and then they put us in the in the 522nd fireballs, 
uh, and I would so I was in three of the four squadrons at Cannon, excuse me, at Cannon. Uh, when I was at um, Upper Hayford, I was at 79th Squadron both times I was there, a total of seven years. And then uh, when I was at Mountain Home, the RTU at Mountain Home, the squadron identifier escapes me right now. But I was in, I was in the RTU squadron at uh, Mountain Home, uh, training guys to go to England. Uh, let's see. Antonio Vranich asks, what was my one forget unforgettable moment with the F-111? Oh gosh, I don't, I mean, there are so many. I could, I'm not even sure I, when I try and answer that question, I get so many recollections and it's like a, a swarm of bees, just try and pick one out of that swarm. And I can't do it. I would say one of them was what I, uh, what I mentioned earlier was um, uh, where the almost got ejected after a lightning strike. There's the lightning strike itself, never mind almost getting punched out. That was easily enough. I think the uh, second most unforgettable one, although that's just for this instant, was at a um, fighter weapons school mission uh, where... Uh, we were simulating carrying laser guy because we wanted to be like the F-111F. We had this mission profile that we did in Red uh, Fighter Weapons School where we would carry laser guided bombs. There would be uh, special forces guys who would get near enough to the target to illuminate it with laser. And then we'd come in and toss the weapons from a predetermined point that would put the weapons within kinematic range of the target, kinematic maneuvering range of the target and then toss them and skedaddle. And so that's how we would get our laser guided um, capability. It was never gonna work in real life. And it was, it was a uh, that didn't need taking because the way we did it to get weapons on the target, we'd go in with two E models loaded with simulated uh, two Mark 84s each or the GBU, not GBU, the, oh God, I can't talk and remember the designations now, the 2000 pound guided weapon. And to, in order to have it work with two airplanes, you had to keep the airplanes pretty close together. So I was involved fighting wing, which would be about well, 150 feet to the right and uh, maybe about 150 feet back. And so I'm pretty much focused on him and we're flying low level and he's doing his best terrain masking. And that's not a, a formation we ever flew low level because it wasn't useful to any other plausible daytime mission we might have. And so there's a very steep mountain ridge and he was gonna go right up against that mountain ridge with the mountain ridge being on his right and um, forgetting I was on the right side, on his right side. And the only reason I didn't just drill a tunnel through that thing is because it was pretty early in the morning and the, uh, the mountain ridge blocked the sun. And I'm like, why is it dark in here? And I looked in front of me, I just got a face full of mountain and just hauled back on the stick, uh, didn't hit it, as you can tell, and then got back into position, finished the mission. Um, uh, it, young men have a different mindset than older men do. And I'd say almost all women. Anyway, uh, that politically volatile topic aside, uh, they, we actually had an airplane, observing airplane orbiting overhead, and they thought I'd bought it. So that one's pretty memorable. But I could go on, and we're running out of time, so I won't. Um, let's see. Uh, Brian Farrow asks, when the uh, El Dorado Canyon strikes on Libya took place, how fast the stories get around the community? Um, we got uh, top secret debriefs pretty quickly. So I'd say within, although I got to say, I can't, <laughs> I got to rewind my memory banks here a little bit because I was just getting ready to give you an answer that was utter bollocks. Uh, I was not in the Air Force when El Dorado Canyon happened. 
I um, had gotten out of the Air Force for about two and a half years, and I was working for an electrical engineering company. It happened to be one of the things we did was talk radio management stuff, which I won't go into because we're running out of time. And I happened to be in a radio station studio uh, for the debut of a call-in radio psychologist, psychiatrist program, and suddenly we got preempted by Reagan. And President Reagan announcing what we'd done, and I'm surrounded by a bunch of Hollywood types who say violence never sol solves anything. So I wasn't actually in the Air Force when it happened. Uh, it was about a year and a half later when I was up at Mountain Home, and we got a, a top secret debrief that went into last several hours, uh, uh, the telling us in great detail how everything had gone. But I have no idea how how fast that stuff got around um, uh, to do that. It, that. I have no idea how it got fast it got around in time. So I probably shouldn't even answer the question, except I wasn't thinking about it. Um, let's see. Uh, Neuropilot mentions that uh, an SR-71 ejected close to Mach 3. I didn't know about that. And a U.S. MiG-25 test pilot also ejected to Mach 2.6. I, I, I believe that's possible. Um, the MiG-20, at the time, the Russian ejection seats were just a lot better than ours. So I think it's entirely possible that that could have happened, but I just didn't, I didn't know about it. So... Um, Let's see, uh, did I ever fly with Jose Jimenez? Yes, I believe I know you're talking about, I think it was at Cannon, and I think he was an instructor pilot when I was a student. And that's about all I can remember at the time. Um, let's see. Yeah, you Johnny Jungle 80 uh, grew up in Bister. I used to live, I lived in Bister for about six months. It was a pretty neat town. Love that, love that area. Just absolutely loved it. Been back to visit a couple times too. Um, I don't have any, hey, I went on to ask, do I have any memorable low flying moments over Bister? That central part of England was so, uh, so po densely populated. We just couldn't love fly. In the area, and the other issue was that uh, we could not fly in civil airspace without talking to uh, an airways controller, and so that there were like all that civil airspace. The airways were just barriers. We we could get through them, but we had to get radar contact and an IFR clearance in order to do so, and. Um, where otherwise we'd be operating, typically operating basically VFR. And Heathrow and the area around Heathrow, uh, that civil airspace went so close to the ground, we just couldn't fly. South England was just, uh, there was no way, almost no way we could do do that over there. So I don't have any, have any real moments flying over Bister back then. Um, let's see. John Minner asked uh, if any stories about flying F-1 in England against the 527th Aggressor Squadron. No, um, there was an aggressor. The only experience I uh, might have had or would have had with the aggressors was at Red Flag because uh, they did have an aggressor squadron there. But really the role of the aggressor squadron was to mimic as best they could uh, opposition tactics so that air to air, and so we, we had our, our fighters in Vietnam did not have a very good kill rate against uh, North Vietnamese MiGs. And the real, the origination of fighter weapons school and Top Gun was to improve our fighter tactics or test our fighter tactics against squadrons who were specializing in, in uh, prospective enemy tactics. So. There was really no role for us to for the aggressors against us. So I flew with them in the sense I was the same exercises, but it just wasn't what the aggressors were around for. Um, 
Let's see. Neuropilot asks, could a profile shown in Top Gun Maverick have been flown in a 111, dropping into a steep laser target? <clears throat> um, yes. Uh, the, the, not pretty similar. Um, the, uh, they're using, if I remember correctly, they're using F-18s as the airplane. And the F-18 is a, is a 9G airplane. I, I, I don't know if it can sustain 9Gs, but I'll bet it can sustain 7. Um, so the 111, we could pull 7.3 and sustain 5. So we could drop into steep valleys. Uh, and it... At some limit, a 9G airplane would be able to stay in a valley where a 7G airplane wouldn't be able to. Uh, we used to have a, in Turkey, there was a valley we called the Millennium, Millennium Falcon Pass that we would fly low level to Coney Range or our weapons training deployments. And that was always a bit of a gut check because you could go into the, it was a very narrow kind of uh, Grand Canyon like thing, but on a smaller scale. And I was always a bit of a gut check to see if you could stay in the uh, in the Millennium Falcon Pass and not have to have to pull out of it. So yes, mostly, but not completely. Um, so I guess uh, the uh, boy that hour went fast. Yes, Jeff. So I, I think we're going to wrap up on one question here. I would like your opinion on you. I think you probably missed it by the the freckle punny. It's just just uh, just a bit up. How good or bad does Jeff think the F-111B would have been as a naval fighter? That's a great question. Um, I, it would have been better than the Navy made out. I think it had, it was a bigger airplane, but it would fit on a carrier. Its landing performance, its deck performance is better than F-4. It would have had a better radar. It, than the F-14 and uh, better, would have had a longer hang time. It could have gone out and loitered longer because it just carried more fuel. Um, so I think it actually would have been uh, about as good as the F-14. F-14 was not a dogfighter, uh, but there is, there's definitely within uh, Naval Aviation and the Air Force, maybe not so much now, but it, definitely at the time, uh, the rest of the Air Force acted to uh, enthrall to air to air, all about air to air. So uh, the F-111 was never going to be an air to air fighter. The F-14 plausibly maybe could have slightly been. I don't think it would have beat hardly anybody except an F-111 because the wing loading issues in an F-14 were not as bad as on a 111. But it was uh, it, it was still up there. So. I think it would have been fine, probably, but the Navy just wasn't going to have it jammed down their throat. And to be fair, in the um, in the beauty contest, uh, end of the mission, it was the best looking airplane ever built. So, you know, so you got to give the Navy that. So, yeah, we can build a better looking airplane. Not the F-111 was a bad looking airplane, but it, it was, uh, you know, pretty girl next door next to, I don't know. Elizabeth Monroe, I mean Elizabeth, uh, what's her name, Monroe, I can't, I, so like I said, I can't talk and think of names at the same time, uh, so yeah, it would have worked, but that that isn't the way it went. Well, that's a great way to wrap up, and I saw your uh, comment there, John Minter, I'm glad uh, we you know, brightened up your, uh, your time in hospital, but uh, yeah, Jeff, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and I hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A because, as, as you know, I like some brilliant stories from Jeff. But, uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff, for coming on the show. Okay, man, and see you guys later. Best of luck to everybody. Over and out. Cheers.